Welcome to this video on epidemiology terms. We'll go through a few of the main terms associated with epidemiology. Let's start out with a, just a reminder of a little bit of history. John Snow lived in the 1800s in London and he is considered the father of epidemiology. He's famous for tracking down um, the cause of um, a cholera outbreak. And he's also famous for working on anesthesia and delivering one of Queen Victoria's babies. But the father of epidemiology part comes in because he tracked down the water pump that was starting a cholera outbreak. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through some terms. I wanna start out with epidemiology terms that have to do with the onset of a disease. So if something is acute, that means it had a fast onset. It can sometimes also mean it has a fast resolution, but not necessarily. So for example, someone could get um, an acute illness that causes their joints to hurt just overnight, or we could compare that with if they had a chronic disease, and that comes on over time and lasts for a long time. So that would be chronic, I think I can just put this here, sorry. So the disease lasts for a long time. And um, you often build slowly or develop slowly. This is not always the case though. So for example, my dog got an autoimmune meningitis. And they don't always know what causes that. Obviously, there's something wrong with his immune system that made that happen. But um, most dogs, so it came on, it was acute. And then um, some dogs get better pretty quickly from it. And other dogs have to maybe be on steroids long term. And then their condition is considered chronic. So um, how quickly it comes on as well as the potential for how long it's going to last is whether someone will call it acute or chronic. And like a lot of terms on this page, there's some subjectivity there. Okay, then the third term I want you to know about for timing is latent. And this, um, and actually I'm going to throw this on here. I didn't originally. Recurrent or a relapse. I'd like to put these terms on here too. So this could be it comes and goes. Maybe it has different triggers. Latent means that someone could have the infection but not showing symptoms. So like um, if they got chicken pox and then the infection was kind of hiding and then later on they got uh, shingles from that latent infection. And then recurrent or relapse. So we've got a few different terms here. And all of these come under uh, the category of timing. Okay, and then I'm going to do one other thing to make this make more sense. Let's put a line down here like this and then box this in. And then when you're looking at this later, you'll be like, okay, here are some terms that tell me about the timing of a disease. So the terms were acute, chronic, latent, and uh, I would say relapse would be the other one. Okay, so now the next one is like a real estate term. Location, location, location. We'll do these ones in green. So in this situation, um, what's happening is we're going to give the terms depending on where they are occurring in the body. So let's say that this person had a big pimple on their skin. This is a perfect example of a local infection. It's, re it's contained in one place. Whoa. Sorry, that was really not the way I meant to put that. Local, contained in one place or one spot. This could be um, all different kinds of infections as long as they're confined to that one spot. But if they move and spread throughout the body, then they can be systemic. Full body 
infection, and usually that would also mean you have a full body immune response. So that would be where something like septic shock could be a problem. So the inflammation that occurs locally could be helpful, but if it's in systemic, it could actually cause too much inflammation and the body could go into shock. On the other hand, systemic doesn't always mean something so scary. If you have the flu, you have a systemic infection. It means that your whole body is affected, but um, most people recover just fine from that. Okay, so now, um, oh, and maybe I should say uh, circulating in the bloodstream, either the infection or the inflammation at that point. Okay, so next up, we will talk about um, if an infection moves from one location to another, we call that a focal infection. So let's imagine that this person here has what's called um, gingivitis or periodontal disease, okay? So these are meant to show um, what have started out as a local but um, the bacteria infection in the mouth, chronic, oh, so there's another word, chronic over time, um, then was able to get into the bloodstream and travel to um, the heart. And specifically, it will often then, the bacteria will literally grow and stick to the heart valves. And along the way, the bacteria might take up residence in the blood vessel walls. So they're found in atheroma. So in, in um, atherosclerosis, there's bacteria that are often living in the clots. We didn't used to know this, but it's becoming more well known that this is happening. So a focal infection is what we call this. It's, it moved to another place. It could move, so that local infection could start out local and then it could move systemically, or it could start out local and then just move to another spot and then it's called focal. So there's a third term then, focal as it moves to another spot. And um, the classic example is gum disease, gum disease bacteria. And a lot of times it's things like streptococcus mitis or um, other streps in the mouth. So gum disease bacteria um, go in the blood and then they go stick to heart valves where they're called vegetative growths or the blood vessel walls where they contribute to atherosclerosis. So that's the classic example there. Okay, so now let's go and look at some terms that have to do with the symbiotic relationships. Oh, and we should, let's block this off. So this was our location, location, location. We'll block this off like this. Get your green highlighter. Do, 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 do. Do you hear the birds singing outside my window? Spring is here, we're all loving it. It's supposed to be warm today. I'm happy about that. Okay, maybe I'll actually clean my house this weekend. I don't know, maybe. Okay, so here we go to um, symbiosis. So a lot of times people assume symbiosis means um, that something is a good thing, and it can be, but it also can be bad because the term just means that um, two organisms living together. So uh, living together is what it literally, well, so bio means life and then sim means together. So it can be good, it can be bad. The common um, one for good is mutualism. And that one is a type of symbiosis in which both organisms benefit. And so the example I would give you, um, we could maybe make some, oh, uh, let's use like purple for uh, gram-positive lactobacillus in your gut. I'm using a purple highlighter. I don't know if you can see that. Or maybe staph epi on your skin. So these would be uh, normal, normal flora or probiotic flora. I'm using purple here. So your normal flora that are good. And, and they, you, if you were going to give this a theme, it would be you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So 
So they're both giving something to the other. We are giving the bacteria a place to live and food to eat, and they often are regulating our um, metabolism, our mood, our immune system. It's just amazing the things that are being becoming understood about the importance of our normal flora. Okay, then something that's not so pretty would be pair. Oh, and this is the scratching of my my back. <laughs> then parasitism, though, this is still considered a symbiotic relationship. But it's when only, uh, or I'm gonna, I'm going to change the definition just a little bit. Normally, they say it's only one organism benefits and the other doesn't. But what about this? What about if one organism benefits a lot more? Because if you think about a tapeworm, so this would be classic example, would be um, parasitic worms, like a tapeworm. They um, get to live inside of us and get nutrients from that, but um, they actually give our immune system some calming signals and they help to potentially, this is um, an area of research, to calm our own immune system down and reduce the risk of autoimmune disease or allergies. Um, of course, a lot of times we just notice the bad things here and that if they get out of control, they can lead to malnourishment and actually weaken the host to the point where then they get other what we call secondary infections. So there, it, it's always a little more complicated too. Never just as black and white as maybe the terms that we would like it to be. Okay, so this one will um, box in in orange. This is your relationship category. So we've done timing, the location, and then relationships. Okay, next set of terms I wanna do have to do with how far has the infection spread. So if you, if this was like the infection started here in, in a population and then how far did it get, that center would be what we would call ground zero patient. or patient zero, sometimes they call it. Patient patient zero, I think, is the name. Uh, oops, I think I should have said patient zero. Like in an Ebola, Ebola outbreak, they might try to figure that out. And um, you can put, let's see, orange, what color? Oh, yellow, let's use yellow. Okay, so uh, this would be just at the beginning of the infection. And then um, if, an infection is locally found normally in a population. We say it's endemic. So like this graph over here, which say, so let's say the flu. There's always a little bit of it going on in a population. Endemic. It's um, low levels in population. And then compare that with epidemic. Let's use a different color for that. How about blue? Look at now how it's spiked up from its normal endemic population. And now all of a sudden we have a lot more people getting it. So maybe put some blue arrows out like this. And we'll put that in blue. So an epidemic is a sudden increase. Or it could maybe it's not always sudden. It could also be a dramatic increase. So like they often talk about obesity being an epidemic. And it has um, didn't come on overnight, but it certainly has had a dramatic increase. And then if you um, go all the way, and, you know, crossing country lines, crossing um, potentially like oceans, uh, things like that, then something could be called a pandemic. And that's when it is either worldwide or has spread across country lines or oceans. So it's a little subjective. Okay, so let's go ahead and box this one in like this. I want to use purple. Okay, and then how easy is it to catch something? Can I catch, um, can I catch that? <laughs> so if it is able to be passed at all, it's called communicable. It can be communicated to another person. 
If it is uh, very easily spread to another person, then we describe it as contagious. Or even sometimes you'll see people say highly contagious. So if it is spreadable at all, we call it communicable. And if it's very easily spread, then we say that it's contagious or easily or highly contagious. And then some diseases are described as non-communicable. A good example of that would be if you know someone that has rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, basically any autoimmune disease. Those would be considered non-communicable. I'm going to use, wait, what did I do? Oh, yellow. Let's outline this one in yellow. Okay. And then the last terms are what you would see if you're looking like at the Centers for Disease Control to study something. So our country has a government agency called the Centers for Disease Control. They're the ones that put out all the vaccine information and stuff like that. So that's called the CDC, and every week they um, publish a paper called, um, I think, Morbidity and Mortality. So morbidity is whoever is sick, and mortality, so this would be morbidity. So it, like they might say, obesity is a great cause of morbidity in the country, meaning if someone's obese, then they might end up getting type 2 diabetes or other illnesses. If they died from a disease, then we say mortality. What color have I not used? Red? Oh, pink. I haven't used pink on this one. So let's use pink for mortality and morbidity. So if they're sick, it's morbidity. If they've died, it's mortality. And then there are some terms as the disease catches on. So um, this person, let's say they caught the plague, they would be reported by our government as incidents. This would be the number of new cases. And then when they're keeping track of at any given time how many people actually have the illness, that is the prevalence. So all the new people that got sick that week plus the number of people that are still sick. So total number of sick people from that disease. So which number will virtually always be greater will be prevalence. And incidence is just like now we've added this many new cases this week. And then uh, mortality. Four. And they would keep track of how many people died from a disease in a given week as well. Okay, thanks for your good attention. See you in the next video. At least I'm assuming you had good attention. I'm sure you did.